Imagine having to travel over an hour and a half by car to do your banking. If you're in one of this province's so-called banking deserts, you know that situation all too well already. H.G. Watson is our new Ontario Hub's assistant editor, and our story about this is currently on our website. She joins us now with details. Welcome. Hi. Now, to better understand the scope of this issue, let's take a look at some of the numbers when it comes to the percentage of bank branch losses. These are the three provinces that saw the most closures between 2014 and 2017. So as we can see, Saskatchewan had a 14.8 drop over those three years. It now has 37 fewer options for in-person banking. Manitoba saw a 12.8 decline, a loss of 27 locations. And Ontario came in third. Our 7.1 decrease translates to 193 fewer brick and mortar locations. It puts us slightly above Canada's 6.9 total drop, and it means Ontario's branch losses make up 44% of the 441 branches that were lost across the country. Those numbers by the Canadian Bankers Association. So my first question to you is, where in Ontario are these losses happening? Well, we're actually seeing banks closing right across the province. Um, I mean, and that's really because of the pickup in online banking, which, you know, is not necessarily a bad thing. There's a lot of good access that comes out of being able to bank online. Um, but why this problem is particularly significant in the north and why I wanted to explore it in this story is just because of the distances involved here. Um, I talked about in the story of the bank closures in Atacokan, a CIBC and a TD closed there. That means that for residents that bank with CIBC, they're now their closest branch is over 150 kilometers away in Fort Francis. When we say banking, you know, a lot of people will start to think, well, why not online banking? But tell me, why are these losses in these particular areas so significant? Right. I mean, really, it's about the populations of people that live there. Um, you know, for seniors, for women that might be in vulnerable situations, for Indigenous peoples, they may not have, if they don't have a brick and mortar bank, they may not be able to as, as easily access some of those online options. Um, to give you another example from my story, you know, what really made this something that I wanted to report on um, was when I ended up talking to the executive director of the Rainy River Women's Shelter because she told me a little a story about how when women are leaving abusive relationships, one of the first things they need to do is open a new bank account, which is something I never actually considered, which of course though makes perfect sense. You wouldn't want to be sharing finances with someone that you're trying to leave or to escape from. Um, so for them, if there isn't a brick and mortar bank location in their town or if there's only one, that's, you know, that can actually be a safety issue, that they don't have those other options to go open a bank. And people may say, well, they could do something online, they could use another option. But, you know, if you don't have a smartphone, if you don't have a computer, that means you can only go to the public library to use a bank, which again, is not safe for women that are trying to leave these situations. Uh, we touched on people who use banking online, digitally. I want to pull up another board. The majority of customers um, who use online banking, it's an overwhelming number, 68%. Um, and so if we look at the numbers here, it says 12% of Canadians use branch banking. And they still rely on the brick and mortar stores. That's actually down considerably 29 and 2,000. 17% uh, of those are aged 55 and older, and 8% of those are under 35. Now, you talked about the vulnerable group in terms of women fleeing domestic violence. How about other communities? Indigenous communities you had touched on, but uh, what are the challenges right. there? Well, there's very um, a study that came out of Menno Simons University that was done for the federal government. Uh, this was a few years ago, actually looked at the access to banking on reserves and in Northern First Nations communities. And what they found is that there's actually very little access. So very few reserves, there's actually a brick and mortar bank, which means that populations there are either having to rely on online banking, but sometimes, again, you have these same issues where people can't afford a smartphone necessarily, or even the internet access is not very good. So then on the flip side, they're also then relying on retail banking. So these are sort of the banks that are offered by popular retailers, or they might be using payday loan lenders, which we know have very high interest rates and are not always beneficial necessarily for people. Um, 
but as well for, as I touched on for seniors, and you know, I don't want to generalize about all seniors. Uh, you know, my parents use online banking; they're very familiar <laughs> about it. Um, but I think there are a lot of seniors. You know, there is a desire to learn about online banking, um, but you know, they might be intimidated by that technology. They might want someone to train them one on one, as opposed to having to go online and figure out how to do it themselves. And you know, if the bank branch isn't there, or there aren't those resources in that community, then they aren't necessarily able to to learn how to do that. Now, you know, I did reach out to some of the banks and the Bankers Association in reporting this story, and they have said that they are committed to doing that training. Excellent. So that's, I think, something definitely to follow up on, whether people are actually learning how to use these services. You touched on uh, the payday lenders. How do they kind of factor in this? Is this is there a risk at, involved when you don't have, um, you know, the brick-and-mortar banks, but you do have these payday loans? I think it's an accessibility risk. Um, there certainly has been some research um, out of the states as well as uh, some in Canada that has shown that payday loan lenders tend to crop up in urban centers and in rural places where there aren't necessarily as many uh, brick and mortar bank or there aren't as many banking options. Um, so I mean, and the risk there is that well, that's quick and easy access to funds that people may need, the interest rates can be very high. Um, so that's definitely a concern. What are the solutions here when we're looking at, you know, when people don't have the brick and mortar and uh, may necessarily not be able to access online banking? What are, we talk what are some solutions there? Well, I mean, in northern communities, there certainly are, is a large presence of credit unions. Um, the credit, uh, credit Union Association of Canada, that they told me that they have over 150,000 customers in northern Ontario. Um, so, and they do have many brick and mortar locations, uh, some in communities where there is no longer a bank. So that is one option for people. Um, another the option that people have tried to champion in the past, particularly the, Can the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, is that they um, actually would like to put in postal banking. And postal, what postal banking is, is that the Canada Post would, in, in addition to its postal services, would also offer financial services. Um, and there's actual precedent for that. So um, if you look at New Zealand, if you look at it, Switzerland, if you look at France, these are postal systems that also offer a full suite of financial services, including loans. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Again, your article is on our website, tvo.org. Some very informative stuff. That's H.G. Watson, our Ontario Hub's assistant editor. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.